Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. The words of scripture for us to consider today, this ninth in our series of parables, is found in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, a parable known as the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Jesus told this parable to certain people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on others. Two men went up to the temple courts to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself like this. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all of my income. However, the tax collector stood at a distance and would not even lift up his eyes up to heaven but was beating his chest and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went home justified rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the Gospel of our Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Friends in, in Christ Jesus, about this time, the month of August, probably on this date, 500 years ago, a certain man was into his fourth month, his fourth of 11 months of hiding, being hidden away by the German princes in the Wartburg Castle. In April of 1521, he had stood before a powerful emperor and took his stand on the clear word of Scripture in the face of pressure from governmental and even church superiors to take it back and stand on human thoughts, human wisdom. Back in April, we, we commemorated that Here I Stand speech that Martin Luther gave before the Emperor Charles V in a sermon here recognizing the 500th anniversary of Luther saying, Here I Stand. I can do no other. We join with him on God's word and say, here we stand. Uh, you likely know that those 11 months that Martin Luther spent in the Wartburg Castle, he wasn't just sitting on his hands or idly twiddling his thumbs. Coming up on December, he began to translate the New Testament. He actually translated that whole New Testament from Greek to the common language of the people in German between December and March. Quite an accomplishment which blessed the world of his day and blessed our day because it was the step towards bringing God's word to the people. Now, you know what had set this all in motion. He had penned those 95 theses back in October of 1517, and he had put those up in order to, well, challenge the university theologians of the day to a debate, a debate about repentance. Repentance. What, what is it all about? What does it mean to repent? And so listen to the first of those 95 theses that actually led on the way to Martin Luther being in the Wartburg Castle in hiding. The first thesis. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Amen, when our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, He willed that the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. 
500 years later, we are not squirreled away in a castle in hiding, nor are we tasked with translating the Bible. We actually did just have leaders in our fellowship take a, quite a substantial investment of time and resources to produce a faithful translation called the Evangelical Heritage Version. And they actually named that, that project the Wartburg Project, commemorating that effort by Martin Luther to bring that message of God's Word to the people of today. But not our task. You don't need to translate Greek with me this morning. And you're not here, and I'm not here, to nail a parchment with, with a challenge to debate on the church doors. In fact, if I nailed something to them, the glass would probably break. And you are rather here not to see words posted on a door, but to hear the word proclaimed from a pulpit, this pulpit. And the words we speak of today Get back to that first of the 95 theses, theses about repentance, because that's what this parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector is about, repentance. What exactly does it mean to repent? So listen to these words of Jesus, to this parable, and our, our explanation of it, and we're going to find out what it actually means when the repentant sinner says, Lord, have mercy on me. So there's a lamb burning on the temple altar of sacrifice. And as you walk in that courtyard, the, the smell of incense wafts through the air, a pleasant smell, mixed in with that burning meat smell, burning lamb. And as you elbow your way in that courtyard through a mass of humanity in the temple courts, your eyes narrow the, their focus to a single individual, the way he's acting, the way he's speaking loudly, the way he's dressed, standing tall, and, but dressed in long flowing robes, you can tell he's, he's someone that we need to be paying attention to. You can easily see him standing out. Yep, he's all business. A religious professional from head to toe. Then, at the corner of your eye, you catch a glimpse of someone else. He's kind of inconspicuous and in pretty bad shape. It looks like he's been crying. He's not the center of attention. He's off by himself. He won't even look up, but head bowed, pounding on his chest. Listen. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself like this. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. However, the tax collector, he stood at a distance, would not even lift up his eyes, but he was beating his chest and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You catch that the Pharisee had lots to pray about? What was his favorite word in his prayer? It's the one he repeated so often. Was it Lord? Was it a prayer that repeated help? Did he say forgive a number of times? No. The repeated word was a word that can become all-encompassing into the human self. And when it becomes all-encompassing, it becomes ugly. I. I thank you. I am not like other people. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all of my income. And this Pharisee, you see, is, is celebrating his own personal Thanksgiving day there in the temple courts. He thoroughly thanks God for himself. He comes down, though, with amnesia when it comes to remembering what God has done. 
doesn't mention the blessings that God has given to him. I guess you would assume that he doesn't thank God for anything because he thinks he didn't need anything from God. He is everything. Not only that he wants, he thinks he's everything that, that God wants. How lucky God was to have a guy like this go into the temple and worship him. Not only did he not rob, he gave a tenth of everything. Not only did he avoid being a glutton, he fasted two times a week when God's ceremonial law said uh, a faithful follower of God in the Old Testament should fast one day a year. He went above and beyond. Why? Why should he bother turning to God when he was doing just fine? Doing just fine in his own estimation. Why turn to someone else for salvation when he was getting by good on his own? As you look at that and, and you think about that, this is the all-consuming eye that definitely becomes ugly. And in this parable, we, we readily see the evil that is there, the pride of, that is there, and almost like a, a stick figure, a straw man setting up that so easy to knock down and condemn the pride of self-centeredness. But as Jesus told the parable, the listeners of his day, that Pharisee is exactly the way that the people thought that their religious leaders were supposed to be. People did stand up and say those prayers like that, and that's the kind of leader that those who were listening initially thought, oh, Jesus is going to say some good things about this guy. That is the same kind of person that was admired and emulated in Martin Luther's day. It's actually the driving reason someone who would say a prayer like that and strive so hard to be good and do good deeds in the eyes of his society, that's what drove Martin Luther to go to the monastery in the first place before 1517. And if you were to see somebody like that today, stand up with those words, I were to see somebody like that today, I would probably be pretty quick to, to vote for them for mayor, governor, or president. Look at the good things I have done. Yeah. So Jesus turns that on its side. Turns it upside down, in fact, when he brings up the other man in the parable. Not a Pharisee, but a publican, not Republican, this has nothing to do with politics. A publican was uh, the old word for a tax collector, the tax man. And the tax man, well, he was just that, probably a tax cheat. He had skimped on other people's taxes and skimmed some off the top. He was not full of himself, though. He was running on empty. When other people lifted up their heads to God in prayer, he looked down. He was not praying to be praised, but, but he was praying for help to be forgiven, not bragging, but repenting. He was turning. He was not turning towards himself, though. He was turning away from himself, and he was turning towards God. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Literally, he was saying, God, be appeased. God, be appeased because your wrath, I am deserving of your wrath. Your wrath should come down upon me. But let your wrath be appeased, God, not because of anything I have done. I cannot look to someone, to myself, to appease you and take away these wrongs. I have done. I cannot make it right. God, have mercy. Make it right. And that's exactly what God does. 
through the Savior Jesus Christ, when we are running on empty, knowing our own sins, knowing that they condemn us, knowing that we do not deserve anything from a good God, he forgives us in Christ Jesus. And Jesus himself says, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, this man went home justified rather than the other. Justified, declared holy in God's sight. With God's wrath appeased, declared innocent, forgiven. Because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever exalts, uh, whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Isaiah the prophet explained this truth in another way in his 59th chapter. He was talking about the deeds of accomplishing eternal salvation for people, uh, accomplishing the removal of sins, the removal of idolatry. And this is what Isaiah said about the Lord. The Lord saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene, no one to accomplish forgiveness for his beloved people. There was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. No one else could, so God did. God did forgive. God did accomplish salvation. Through the suffering and death of his dearly beloved son, Jesus Christ, he appeased himself. He made that payment of his own son. A sacrifice better than a lamb burning on the altar, a sacrifice better than a tenth or even all of everything that I get. Because how could, how could offerings like that equate to removing hell from our payment ledger? Only the death of God's Son could. And that was the eternal answer. Forgiveness in the death of Christ coupled with Christ Jesus coming back from the dead so we can live with him forever in heaven. Have you heard this parable? Read it once, talked it through another time. Who do you see in the mirror? I know who I see. But in your heart of hearts, whom do you identify with more? The Pharisee or the tax collector? Think of it. We, we are Lutheran. We're here. We are Lutheran. And, and I might not fast twice a week. But I wasn't down on the island on Friday night drinking at the bar and driving home and risking others' lives. Pretty good of me. I might not give a tenth of all I get, but, but I put something in the offering plate, or if I don't put it in the offering plate, I give online. Right? I know that I'm saved by grace alone. I'm a Lutheran, saved by grace alone, but you know, I'm pretty good too. God should be real happy with me. I'm doing my best. What more could God want? And if we're too quick and confident in, in identifying with that tax collector, then watch out for humility that becomes false humility, humility that becomes a show of humility, because the Pharisees were good at that too. I can see myself in the mirror as the Pharisee, when I'm being honest with myself. Will you see someone else with me in the mirror? Will you exchange the security blankets of self-righteousness for the sackcloth and ashes of genuine repentance? Turning towards ourselves isn't only sinful, it's nonsensical. Do you really think that God is pleased that you are sitting here in a pew today, one of about ten people gathered in church, and God must be so happy with you because you're one of the few here. You realize a potato could do that? Potato could sit in the pew today. 
Do you really think that coming to God with your offerings in the offering plate or online would make God happy with you? When he hasn't just asked for your offerings, he asked for your entire heart. A hundred percent of all of you to be given to him all the time. Nonsensical to think that we can turn to ourselves. So we turn, like the tax collector, to God. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And we recognize that God does have mercy. That everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The tax collector, he was humble, and the Lord exalted him. The tax collector knew his sin, the Lord forgave him. And in turning to Jesus, the tax collector was exalted by Jesus in an amazing role reversal. He lifted him up. He who has ears to, ear, ears to hear, let him hear. The first will be last and the last will be first. That's how forgiveness works. Those who trust in God and what Jesus did for us without deserving it. <laughs> Jesus taught it. Luther believed it, confessed it, he, he wrote about it. That a Christian's entire life is just that. A life of repentance. Turning to God over and over again. And when I look in the mirror and I see that Pharisee there, I say, God, forgive me for that arrogance and pride. And he has mercy again. Because no one else could, God did. And we trust in that with our repentant hearts. Because no one who claims to Jesus in faith will say, God, I'm really thankful you didn't make me like him or her. We will say there, but for the grace of God, go I. But not in a boasting way. We truly admit God, thank you for not giving me what I deserve. You know how guilty I really am. And yet you mercifully declared me not guilty in Jesus. Perhaps as you go from this place today and think about that word repentance, there is a financial guru of this day, he happens to be a Christian as well, who that's something that comes to my mind whenever anybody asks him, how are you doing? He's, a, he's on the radio and takes callers. They call and say, how are you doing today? He always says, better than I deserve. Repentant hearts. Hearts like the tax collector will take that answer for every day of our lives. That description of how things are for us. How are you doing today? better than you deserve, just as I am doing better than I deserve, forgiven in Christ Jesus. May God strengthen us to, to move forward every day with that understanding of repentance. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Amen.